thank you everyone um, for joining us today. Um, we're really excited that you're able to be here and sorry that we running a little bit late. So I'll take full blame for that since I uh, made the, the time slots. So <laughs> I apologize, but thank you all for being here with us today. Um, we are recording. So just to let you know that that's happening, please use the Q&A feature um, rather than the chat for um, questions. Um, the transcript is below with auto captions and we'll be working on updating those when those um, go live on YouTube. Um, and then also please use the hashtag WolfCon21 uh, uh, to share out on Twitter and such. So with that, I will pass it over to Jennifer. Hello everyone and welcome to Folio Short Talks. I'm, I'm very excited. This is gonna be an excited exciting session. So we have a series of six lightning talks about folio features and functionality. Um, and I'm going to introduce the title and the presenters of our panelists today. So first off, we have OCLC integration by Laura Daniels from Cornell University, then integrations with other systems, Phil Robinson from also from Cornell University, followed by dashboard app from ERM team presented by Owen Stevens, uh, Folio ERM team head, and then entity management by Jason Kovari, Cornell University, and then uh, linked data, Simeon Warner, also Cornell University. And last but not least, we have a recording entitled Deployment Practice of Folio at Shanghai Library by Chai Jiang, Jai Tu, and please excuse me if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, we are using the Q&A for all questions. Uh, please don't use the chat. And with that, I will give it to Laura Daniels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I just need to share my screen and go into present mode. Okay, and um, on behalf of my several other Cornell colleagues um, who are also giving short talks today, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with an historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. So we acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people past and present to these lands and waters. As Jennifer mentioned, I will be speaking about, sorry, I need to make my little black box in Zoom go away. I will be speaking today about um, integration of a CLC connection with Folio's inventory, specifically about single record import. And I will be speaking from the perspective of a wildly enthusiastic and engaged, to quote the vision and strategy statement, individual subject matter expert in the Folio community, specifically the metadata management special interest group. So I'm going to start with the problem that we needed to solve, and that is that technical services staff routinely import single bibliographic records from WorldCat, which we just usually call OCLC. And in US libraries, at least, this is an integral part of our routine workflows for acquisitions and cataloging. Folio has a data import app and it can handle single records, but there are several reasons this is not a great solution for most of us. Um, first of all, it's a completely separate app from where the staff needing to, needing to use this functionality would be doing the rest of their work. Um, more importantly, it has what I think of as overly generous permissions. So anyone giving, given access to it has the potential to do a lot of unintentional damage. Um, and finally, using it for single records would make the import logs unwieldy and cluttered and difficult to use for tracking down problems. Um, I, I think it's worth noting this, this is a particularly US centric problem, and it's also more of a problem for larger libraries. So perhaps because of this, other features kept getting prioritized over this by the Folio community. So four larger academic institutions decided 
that this was important enough for us to spend a little extra money on. And we paid index data to develop a single record import feature within Folio's inventory app. So inventory consult, it's not inventory, index data started by consulting members of the funding institutions first, but then went to the rest of the Folio community for feedback. And as Mike Gurrell emphasized earlier today, because this project is open, the code for this feature goes back to the community. Uh, collectively, we faced a few challenges with this, um, as is fairly common in the Folio community. When there are different ways to solve a problem, we did not all agree on what the best method was. And there are primarily two methods we can import single records, and I'll go into a little more detail about those on the next slide. Um, <coughs> No, not due to index data at all, but communication with OCLC was sometimes challenging, but necessary. And finally, either method, either the pull or the push necessarily relies on some data import functionality for mapping the records into the inventory app. And so development with data import needed to be coordinated. So we, we refer to these two different methods to push to um, in, to import a re single record into Folio as pull and push. And the pull method starts in Folio's inventory and makes a call out and retrieves a record. So we can pull a record from OCLC WorldCat. We can also pull records from Library of Congress and I believe from various other national or union library catalogs as well. The push method starts in OCLC connection and sends the record into Folio via TCP IP. So here I've, I've marked what I see as advantages in blue and, dis, and disadvantages or drawbacks in red. Extensibility seems really important to me. In the future, we won't necessarily be importing MARC data from WorldCat. Um, we won't even necessarily be importing MARC data, but we will be importing data from somewhere. So the only real disadvantage as I see it to the pull functionality is that we can currently only pull in the master version of the record. If we want to make local edits, we currently need to do that within Folio itself after we import the record. The push method does us allow us to import a record with unsaved changes or local tweaks. And this is how most of us are used to doing things. As I understand it, though, TCP IP is a kind of antiquated protocol, and this method is not so extensible. So I see this as an opportunity to question some of our assumptions around how we need our work to happen. Um, Index data in response to community feedback is actually working on giving us both methods. Uh, currently, push only works for creating new records, not for overlaying existing records. If we want to be able to use push to update records, we need to find a way to indicate a match point. So going forward, we now have in Iris uh, the basic functionality in place there are some fixes still needed and further development is definitely still needed. And that development includes, um, for example, additional profiles or the ability to customize profiles so that we can merge rather than completely overlaying data if we want to do that. Um, these bullet points are what I see as the most important points illustrated by this story. So for Folio to be successful, we need to be willing to challenge our assumptions, as Anya mentioned shortly um, in the previous uh, session. And we also need to be willing to consider reconsider some of our workflows. And that's both in response to the realities of a system that's still under development and in anticipation of future changes to our work itself. I really hope that the ways we thought through this particular functionality will put us in a better position to make me, to make use of multiple sources and formats of metadata in the near future. And I also think this speaks to how we in the community can leverage our resources and collaborate to keep making the product better for everyone. I will stop sharing now and turn things back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we do have one question. Um, would you like to answer that at the end? It's how do you authenticate the uh, to OCLC for the Z3950 pull into Folio considering that authentication would be for the entire tenant? 
and you know i don't feel like i have the technical ability to answer that so maybe if somebody fra who's been engaged with the development behind the scenes could uh, could chime in on that that would be great thank you and we'll go on to the next presentation Hello, all. I'm uh, Phil Robinson, Director of Library Systems at Cornell. Can you hear me? Can you see me or see my uh, presentation, more importantly? Uh, if so, or if not, please let me know. I'm noticing yes. that my, my background has uh, foo, but it's not really about foo. I really am talking about folio. I'm just the, kind of the L. Um, so I'm here to talk about Cornell system integrations, and uh, we have quite a few of them. Um, we have a lot of smaller custom ones, but today I wanted to talk about some of the main ones that we're working on for our go live, uh, which is happening basically now. Um, so some, first, some context and definitions. Integration is a really broad term. It can mean a lot of different things to different people. Here, I'm just restricting it to refer to inter interactions of folio APIs and data with other systems. Um, there are a lot of uh, variabilities and types of integrations, a lot of dimensions to consider. Are they one way or bilateral? Or multilateral? Are they uh, asynchronous or nearly synchronous? I never say fully synchronous. There's always some, you know, milliseconds or something, even with real time. Are they outbound from Folio and or inbound to Folio? Um, do they involve vendor systems, enterprise, or custom systems? Um, they can run immediately. They can run once every five minutes. So the frencies uh, can be can be different. So we have a, a wide variety there. Uh, some involved uh, files, some involved APIs, or some combination. Uh, we have to integrate with older systems a lot of the time, and often they require files. Some require XML, some require JSON, some something else, something totally custom. Uh, and another category, and you can probably think of others, um, direct connect, like directly connecting to the other data source or application, or are you orchestrating all this with a central integration broker? For some of ours at Cornell, uh, we're fortunate to have a central integration team, which I actually uh, created uh, several years ago um, and then moved on to the library. But uh, they're currently using Dell Boomi, which many have not heard of, but it's a very good uh, uh, integration broker product uh, that's fairly easy to get up to speed on. Um, other competitors in that space you may have heard of, MuleSoft, um, Tipco, Oracle SOA Suite, they run the gamut. You can, you can find free open source ones, you can find expensive commercial ones, um, but Dell Boomi has been a good product for us. Um, but we're not using it for all of the integrations, just for some. So here's a list of uh, just a few of our key integrations. Um, the development is done on most of them. Uh, it's underway in some of them. Testing is underway or has completed with some of them. Um, so just starting at the top, archive space um, is used uh, in our archives area uh, for special collections. And that's uh, basically a one-way update of, of archive space data to Folio, and it'll be scheduled. Uh, we're not sure when we'll, you know, how often the scheduling will happen. Um, they're aiming for um, just uh, picking up changes, picking up deltas, because there's a lot of data in our archive space instance, and uh, we just want to pick up changes and put that, put the relevant data in Folio. Um, Borrow Direct, uh, some folks on the line might actually be part of this consortium. Uh, that's uh, several universities uh, that um, have a sort of an ILL type uh, type interaction for just for themselves. Um, and it's API based to a real time integration. Um, Bursar fees, fines and exports uh, or exports of that. There's a few export um, outbound integrations. In this case, um, this is uh, called a transfer in general, um, um, folio parlance. Uh, so it's an export of fees and fines that are ready to be transferred to our Bursar area at Cornell. Um, and we have PeopleSoft. Um, you'll find that at Cornell, uh, like many other places, we have basically every system you can possibly imagine. So uh, our Bursar is run uh, in PeopleSoft. So we have a custom file has to be uh, built in a special way that will be sent to PeopleSoft. And it'll be scheduled daily uh, so that uh, the lucky patrons will get their bills through the Bursar, especially students. Um, Kaisoft Annex Inventory. There's a lot of, uh, I know there's a lot of work going on within Folio about remote storage uh, integrations. Uh, we've uh, partnered with Kaisoft for a few years uh, and uh, we really like the system. So we're working with them to do an API based two way real time um, um, Annex Inventory remote storage integration. Um, the work going on there will be shared in some way with the Folio community and there's already work going on in that, in that respect. Um, and that one's in really good shape. It's being tested. Um, 
We have another export, KFS's Kuali Financial System. That's our main financial system uh, from an ancestral uh, system to Folio in a way, um, but it's our uh, kind of open source or community source financial system. So the vouchers, accounts payable data uh, is going to be sent there. Also orchestrated by Dell Boomi, um, scheduled daily. Um, so this is uh, pretty much our uh, financial lifeblood. It's kind of an important uh, integration. And another really important one, of course, is important to most of you or all of you is the patron user import. Um, so in our case, again, we're using the Dell Boomi tool with our central integration team. Uh, it's API based, scheduled daily. It really is an upsert, meaning uh, it, it checks to see whether someone in the enterprise um, identity management systems is already in our folio instance. And if they are, it checks if any data has changed. And if it has, it, it automatically changes it, like if their name changed or something like that. Uh, it doesn't change their permissions. Um, if they're not in the system at all, it adds them with no permissions. And that's basically what it does. And, and again, like another integration we were talking about, it um, only detects deltas. It only, it only detects changes in the enterprise data. So it runs a lickety split. It runs in sometimes just a few minutes, depending on how many changes have happened at Cornell. So at the beginning of a semester, there can be a lot of students and faculty coming on board. Uh, that might be a, a fairly large um, um, you know, import. Uh, but generally it runs pretty quickly. I have a few diagrams in the last few minutes. I know I'm probably uh, uh, getting to the end of my time or close to it. Um, the enterprise user in a port, this is just, these are just high level diagrams. Uh, so Workday, like I said, we have every imaginable system. So Workday does our staff and faculty data. PeopleSoft owned by Oracle has our student data. Uh, Dell Boomi receives that data and then detects uh, what's, what's changed this last time and then sends out the upserts to Folio. Uh, here, here's a diagram, very simple, of the, the Kuali financial system export in a special XML format. Um, a tool like Dell Boomi is really good at, at tran uh, translating files and uh, doing ETL, extract, uh, transform, and load. So invoices and vouchers in a certain status get, set, get picked up by Boomi and then are sent out to our financial system. A few more. Um, the bursar, or uh, what's called the transfer for fees, fines. Uh, we uh, sponsor the development of an export manager app in Folio to share with the community. Um, and that's what we're using uh, to track uh, the exports of this as well as circ logs. Um, so data goes from Folio to um, our, one of our uh, AWS S3 buckets that my team manages. Um, and then the data goes to PeopleSoft through another process involving AWS Lambda. Uh, Annex inventory Kyasoft, there's uh, uses the mod inventory um, and uh, a module, accessioning and deaccessioning, circulation, external retrieval requests, and then uh, updates of folio inventory and location. Does a lot of work. Um, we have a MySQL database, again, in our AWS account uh, that Kyasoft operates. Uh, last one, uh, save the most complex one for the end, borrow direct. Uh, this is meant to show how different partners use different uh, systems, ILSs. Um, we're using NSIP and the Z39.50 protocols uh, and Blacklight uh, for discovery and access. And we're synchronizing inventory locations and statuses, request statuses as people request materials from our library. We request materials from their library using uh, Relay with OCLC. Uh, and that's basically what I had. I went really fast. So I'm happy to answer questions maybe at the end of the session if there's time. And I'll hand it back to Jennifer. Thank you, Philip. That was really interesting. And I'm going to hand the baton to Owen. Thanks. Hopefully you can all hear me and see my screen. And I'm going to talk about a uh, development that I've been working on, which is uh, the Folio dashboard. And to give some background, I work with the ERM development team. I'm the product owner for the two of the key ERM electronic resource management applications in Folio, uh, that's licenses and agreements, which allow you to express your the, the agreements and licenses that you have in place for uh, electronic resources in your library. And as we have worked on these applications, we've come to understand from the uh, community who uh, help us kind of feed into that development process um, what they need from the applications, that um, the electronic resource management contains these very cyclical workflows, often date driven. So every year or every, however, uh, you know, uh, every year uh, or maybe multiple years for multi-year agreements, um, 
you need to review the content in your agreement. You may need to review renewal and cancellation deadlines. And the thing about that is that this means that there's a lot of information about all the resources that you have, but not all of it is um, relevant to you at any one time. And also in larger teams, there may be responsibilities divided up between the uh, which which electronic resources you're managing, or if you're a subject or liaison librarian, which ones you're particularly interested in. And not all the information is relevant to all members of the teams across the library. And then associated with this, we also had kind of demands for various different kinds of information that people wanted to be able to see at a glance easily. They wanted that to be personalizable. So they want to be able to see their view of the data, not, not just a generic one. And they wanted to be reminded about the things they needed to do. And so our conclusion from this was that a personalized dashboard um, would, would be a good approach. And I'll talk in a moment about what that dashboard looks like, um, but the would be a way of, of giving flexibility to institution, to both individuals and institutions, all of whom, or, or all of which had their own specific workflows in relation to ERM. So in the first version of the dashboard that we're about to release with the Juniper um, uh, release of Folio, we, we have the first version of the dashboard, which will allow users to see information, a, a key information at a glance, will be completely personalizable, but is focused on ERM exclusively uh, in the first instance, but is completely designed from the ground up to be extensible beyond ERM. There's nothing that we're doing here that is specific about doing this for ERM. We, we definitely want to bring on board other applications. So the sort of um, use cases we've been collecting from the ERM community in Folio, um, we've already got um, 30 uh, use cases for a dashboard just in ERM alone. And the kinds of things that people are saying they want to be able to do is to show licenses or agreements which are approaching their end date or need some action taking because their cancellation review uh, deadline is approaching or their content review data is, is approaching. Also wanting to get lists of licenses or agreements that are responsibility of a particular user um, and also where data is being brought in from external knowledge bases that describe the electronic resources, wanting to check the status of those synchronizations. So our initial release, we expect to, to support at least a third of those use cases. Um, and this is what the dashboard will look like. So um, what we're calling dashboard is kind of a, a canvas on which you can then place uh, little functional areas which we're calling widgets um, and each widget is completely personalizable to you and each dashboard is completely personalizable to you so if we look at uh, an individual widget this is what a, a single widget is and that can fetch and display information from folio applications or other sources and the user can decide which widgets are displayed on the dashboard in what order and also configure those widgets. So for instance, uh, here in the screen illustration, we've got uh, agreements expiring in less than 30 days. Um, that has been completely configured by the user to, um, to be that 30 day limit. They could have configured that to be 60 days or 90 days or, or some other search criteria for agreements in this case. So our next steps, um, as I said, we're going to be doing an ERM focused dashboard as part of the Juniper release. Uh, so that's just coming up now. Um, we're at the moment when you create a dashboard, it's your personal dashboard. But what we're hearing is that people want to be able to share dashboards so that say multiple users who are all on the same team might want to share a dashboard, see the same view of things. So we're, we're going to be developing that functionality. We're going to start to engage with other teams in Folio and look at what uh, date other applications might want to display on the dashboard. And um, in addition to that, we want to start at the moment. All of this data is driven by kind of essentially custom searches that find the relevant data based on some criteria. 
what we want to do is to also look at more active uh, things such as reminders that that will tell the user they need to do a particular task at a particular time. And you can see here is an illustration of what we hope a dashboard might look like when we've uh, got to the end of a full development cycle, maybe version two or three of the dashboard will reach this kind of more graphical and multi-application display. And that is me. Thank you, Owen. And now I'd like to pass it to Jason Kovari, who's going to talk about entity management. Here's my unmute. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, the time today. And also thank you to Laura Daniels uh, for reading out the Cornell University land acknowledgement, um, the location of which I am also um, residing and working. Uh, so I will be speaking about entity management today, and unlike the last three talks, the talk I'm giving is really about ideas more than it is about development. So I would like you to keep that in mind as I go through. So before I begin, though, I want to just um, comment on the fact that I am merely a representative of the now defunct entity management working group, which was um, active throughout 2020 under the auspices of the metadata management special interest group, uh, yeah, special interest group, um, the MMSIG. And I would like all of you to burn these names into your memory because they are all awesome individuals um, who did amazing work on entity management, um, scoping and vision. And uh, for that reason, I would like you to all keep in mind that this is really their work um, as much as it is mine. So, Along those lines, the aforementioned group created a vision document, which has significantly more information than what I'm going to present to you today. I strongly recommend that everybody here read this. Um, the vision document outlines the strategy for what entity management in Folio can and should be. There are user stories, conceptual design, um, diagrams, functional requirements, as well as cross app interactions for the conceived um, entities app. And so that is significantly more context than what I will present today, and um, it's a good read. So I would recommend everybody engage there. So what do we mean by entity management? Essentially, entity management in the context of what the entity management working group um, envisions boils down to three general work areas. The first being um, the most straightforward, perhaps the easiest, which is how we do um, how we use entities in the metadata creation practices that, um, that are so um, core to at least technical services functions in libraries. The second work area focuses on identifying how traditional ILS-based authority management or entity management uh, practices translate into the folio environment. This scope derives from a desire to facilitate longstanding activities critical to data quality assurance uh, that focus on supporting library workflows, as well as a consistent user experience in our discovery environments. Meanwhile, libraries seek to support far more services and functions around entities than what traditional ILSs have afforded. Um, Folio both complicates and provides opportunities for this uh, work in that Folio is not Mark-centric. Uh, there are other data models as um, those who have engaged with Folio likely know, um, including the internal inventory data model, and there are plans to support many more data models. What is important for these two is that having entity management functions which go beyond Library of Congress authorities. So entities drive both from the library community, um, such as LC authorities, as well as data sources not traditionally used in cataloging. Um, further, the vision includes the creation and publishing of local entities um, that are particularly useful for an institutional context. Um, accounting for a vast diversity of data sources will be critical to meeting the needs of libraries moving forward. Um, and having a broader diversity of sources introduces likelihood that an institution may have multiple sources for what represents similar concepts. So for instance, a work from OCLC, a work from Library of Congress, a work from ShareVDE, a work from Wikidata, et cetera, may all have aligned functional and usage expectations in a library workflow. 
but each may employ different data models with different concepts of what a work is. And the vision set forth in that vision doc that I mentioned earlier uh, outlines a path to address um, this diversity of approach. Finally, the work begins to address how Folio may handle entity-based data models. Um, in these models, legacy, straightforward record store solutions and interactions become much less clear. Um, and by designing an approach for Folio to manage entities, we're laying the groundwork to transition select workflows to models like BibFrame, but not exclusive to BibFrame. So um, before I begin, please, um, as you stare at the conceptual model diagram, model modeling diagram, uh, keep in mind first that it's conceptual, and secondly that it includes things which no longer exist in Folio, such as Marcat. Um, when this diagram was created, Marcat was still a thing, um, so please keep that in mind. Um, I realize too late in the game to edit this, <laughs> um, but core to the vision for entity management is the creation of an entities app that manages agents, genres, subjects, works, and other entities, including those currently used internally to Folio as reference data in the environment. Um, again, this model is very conceptual. Um, it demonstrates just a few applications within Folio, such as inventory, mark source record storage, data import, et cetera. Um, but it begins to speculate about how the data could flow between those existing applications and the entities app. And if you are curious about what an entities app can be and how it may relate to other apps within Folio, um, the in addition to this conceptual diagram, the vision document also includes a section on app interactions. And thank you to Charlotte Witts uh, for um, creating this diagram. Uh, and I would also like to speak a bit more on the support for entity-based data models that was discussed earlier. Um, the diagram actually may or may not, I don't believe it does, include anything explicitly about such as a bib frame, bib frame source record storage or RDF source record storage, since it doesn't need to be limited to bib frame, um, or other functionalities that support linked data. This is not a linked data thing. This is a thing that may engage with linked data, but it is not in and of itself linked data. Um, and the reason, a big reason for this is that it's unclear how support for an entity-based data model may really fully come to fruition. So the entity management um, working group outlined how entities can be managed within Folio, but not necessarily how Folio needs to scale up to support fully entity-based data models. Um, and some of the this may be internal to Folio, some may be external to Folio, and I have a feeling that um, my colleagues, me and Warner, may talk a little bit more about this soon, um, so stay tuned for the next talk or so. Um, there are JIRA issues um, for related to this, um, UX Prods 2516 through 2526, um, each one of those, as well as UX Prod 2680. So if anybody is interested in this work, I highly encourage you to please go and comment on and rank for your institution each of these JIRA issues. They are, um, they are really where this work will begin. So um, the more institutions say that this is important, the more likely we will have resources allocated. Um, if you are logged into JIRA, you can see each of these listed off of the EPIC linked at the bottom of this slide. Um, before I close though, I wanna just, um, point to two things very quickly, which are sort of like the elephants in the room for this for this work area. The first is that entity management work undertaken is not itself linked data. I touched on that a little earlier, um, nor is it an attempt to address the codex vision, which those who have been around Folio for long enough may have engaged with at one point. This is really a work area that addresses entity management. It is a scoped area of work. Um, additionally, for those who are watching this space, you may realize that there is mark-based authority, um, authority storage being worked on. Um, Kalila's dev team is, is doing this right now. There might be touch points there, but there's a large gap between the functional requirements of that highly scoped work and what is being discussed as entity management here. I'm sure I probably am way out of time, so I will stop now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. And now I'll pass it to Simeon Warner, who's going to talk on linked data. Thank you. Um, my name is Simeon Warner, and I'm also from Cornell University, where I am the AUL for IT. And I'm going to talk about Folio and linked data specifically, which necessarily implies a, an entity-based model, 
um, but is not entirely overlapping with the concepts that Jason described. But let's start with where we are now. And it seems everyone is crediting Charlotte Witt for their for fun diagrams, and I am too. I will be butchering this one in the next few slides. From the beginning, uh, from the codex vision and through to production, Folio was designed to be metadata format agnostic. And this is illustrated in the diagram here, where we have the source record storage here for, for Mark, separated from the inventory application, which has its own storage and its own format. And that's what all the various apps, such as check in, check out, and all that interact with. Um, people are using the inventory app without a backing mark record, either for the entire description or just for the holdings, as we are at Cornell. Um, the idea is that the source record storage can be built out to support other formats. That hasn't been done yet, um, but that's part of, part of the vision. At the moment, Folio has the quick mark editor built in, directly connecting to the source record storage. But as we heard Laura Daniels say earlier, there's also been work to connect to an external mark editor through the OCL connection connection. Um, so that provides a sort of second model of how data within Folio can be edited. But what about linked data? So far, I've just mentioned Mark. Um, if we look at the vision and strategic objectives for Folio, we can see linked data items in the next couple of years. Uh, more importantly, in the suggested 23 to 25 period, there's a suggestion to develop support for non-MARC record-based metadata models, including Dublin Core, VRA Core, um, and specifically to support entity-based data models, as well as the interchange with linked open data, including BibFrame. What I'm gonna talk about now is a few ideas about how we might, might make progress towards supporting full-scale work in a few years' time. So, the first question is, how do we go about building out a linked data storage and interaction for Folio? Do we say, take the vision that in place of the source record storage, there's a linked data store that then connects to the inventory, connects perhaps to its own internal quick bib frame editor, or perhaps connects to an external bib frame editor? I know there are some interesting questions here about whether this is linked data generally or bibs frame specific. Many things could be rather agnostic, but for example, the translation of the linked data model into the inventory model, that will have to be specific to the particular schema used. So I'm going to focus on bib frame for now. So then there's a, another alternative. Well, perhaps one could make more rapid progress of experimentation by saying, Let's think of an entirely separate linked data cataloging application that has an editor with lookup facilities, has its own store, accesses external entity sources, and then can connect into the inventory app for the rest of Folio functionality that depends upon. To me, this is an appealing path um, for experimentation, even if an eventual more complete integration is desirable. One of the things I think we as a library community are grappling with at the moment is the idea that linked data implies a certain amount of letting go. If we look at the uh, a simplified version of the bib frame model here with the key work instance and item elements on the left hand side, we see that these link out to other bits of data which might either be stored locally or the ones in gold are hopefully links out to addition, uh, external entities managed say by the Library of Congress or some other authority. Um, if we think about how to do that, there's a sense in which the true transition to linked data is really to rely on these entities being managed externally. Now we might have some additional local ones, but there's no need to replicate a Library of Congress name authority entity um, in our source record. So then we can think about, well, how might we divide up parts of a bib frame model and where do different things happen? Um, 
the folio inventory might be used for the holdings and items directly that don't need to appear in the bibliographic model where the key bib frame works and instances are managed. But then we have links to these external sources with appropriate caching and change management to support our operation. So we heard Phil Skrur speak earlier in the week um, about the Sinopia editor and the associated questioning authority lookup service that have been developed as part of the linked data for production project. And one of the things we're thinking about now is, could we build a prototype that integrated the Snopia editor and the questioning authority lookups with Folio as a way to experiment as a seed further linked data work in Folio? I'd be interested to hear from anyone who would like to talk more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And now we have our last recorded presentation um, from Jia Zheng and Jai Tu. And hopefully people can see my screen. I'm going to end this video short because we are short on time. Uh, and hopefully we can get it posted somewhere, maybe on the OLF uh, YouTube channel so people can view it at a later time. But I'm going to start it and then stop at a convenient spot uh, as we approach the end here. And I shared my screen incorrectly. So trying again. Hello, everyone. I'm Sha Jiang from Jiangsu Jiatu. It's an honor for me to introduce the Folio deployment in Shanghai Library. Here are the contents I will talk about. First, deployment architecture. Shanghai Library uses private cloud for de deployment. There are two database services, two Okabi and application services and two front-end services. The whole system run on VMware, and its operation system is CentOS 7. All these can archive dynamic horizontal expansion. In addition, there are a log server, data synchronized server, search engine server, view find server, and CIP2 server. Hello, Jiang from everyone. And unfortunately, that was all we had time for of that video uh, today. And again, I will see if we can get that posted to uh, to the OLF YouTube uh, and let people know when that's available. Hey, thank you so much to all of our panelists. We're um, unfortunately out of time, um, but thank you for attending this session. We will um, convene at the, the five past the hour um, and we'll be sure to get that video posted. I think that we'll definitely be able to do that. So um, um, see you all soon and thank you again. <laughs>